Um, here are some of our members, Pixie Collins, my wife, my wife Barbara Milliken right here, George Ross. George was half Native American, half Pike, and he was born in Tacopa, raised in Tacopa, and he took me and several of our other chapter folks out in the desert and showed us portions of the trace and how to follow it and lore about it. Well, George passed away three or four years ago, and it was a big loss, so I wanted to be sure to recognize George here. And Scott, next to him, did all our GPS work for a long time. He did the GPS recording, and then he put it on his computer and so forth. So that's, I owe him a debt of thanks to that. That is Scott's wife, Sarah Bennett. And then the two pictures on the right are very special people. Cynthia Keenan's. I thought would be here, um, but she hasn't managed to make it. She owns Cynthia's safaris in the town of Tacopa, and she has allowed us to use her lodgings over all those 14 years as a place where we could stay at no charge for a while. We even had an office there and so forth, and she's vital in keeping this chapter alive and expanding what we're trying to do. And below Cynthia is Tom Sudak. Many of you knew Tom Sudak. And he was just such a help to me in the trail work. And he headed the Oster Research Committee for a while. And he died last year. And it's a tremendous personal burden to me. I like Tom so much. And he, he had a historical knowledge that he brought to it. He's the author of the book um, Into the Jaws of Hell about the Mormon Battalion. So if you haven't read that, I would definitely add that. I think it's for sale out there, isn't it not, Mark? Yeah, it's out for sale out there. Okay, so now I'm going to give you the overview and then I'll talk about specific findings that we've done over the 14 years. And I'm going to start with a geographical overview so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, you see the big white area up there? That is prompt, dry, light lake bed. Most of it lies in the state of Nevada. And you can see the Nevada California state line there. Um, and just inside the Nevada state line, Stump Spring, a couple people have mentioned it. It was a very well-known water source. As people came down from Blue Diamond, they would stop at Stump Spring. It wasn't always wet, sometimes it was dry. And there's another story there. But we take our starting point to be Stump Spring, and then you see this, these ridges here? That's a small volcanic ridge, and it separates the Pahrump Valley from the California Valley which is a very large, dry valley here. And then as the trace went across California Valley, it came up and you see these mountains. The, this is the North Nopa Range and the South Nopa Range. And between the two where they come together, there's a saddle and that's the lowest place. So the trails, the, both the wagon trail and the mule trace, went across immigrant pass as their way of proceeding. Their next stop was Resting Spring, a very, very large spring with a huge waterfall and it showed up in one of the earlier presentations. And then the next geographic feature is the Amargosa Canyon. And it begins up at the present day of Tacopa, comes down there, comes out here and goes through a sandy, a very sandy area, and these are the Dumont sand dunes, goes through there and ends up at another spring, a very poor water called Salt Spring. So our territory is from Stump Spring down to Salt Spring. Oh, and by the way, I've set aside, I'm, I'm going to try to get through and leave time, five or ten minutes for questions. So. Um, if you can hold your questions, but I know there's a lot of detail here, but I will leave some time for questions. Oh, 
I meant to say, and then the ge those were the geographic features. And the cultural features are, it says Charleston here and there. Can you read it in the back? No, too small. I, um, anyway, Charleston View is a street grid. The owner of that land in the 1950s, Gordon Wiley, decided that he wanted to create a subdevelopment. So he went out and graded with bulldozers a huge street grid that was supposed to get bought up and become a town. Well, it never happened, but the street grid is still there. It, of course, impacted greatly parts of the old Spanish Trail. But the street grid is there, and I'll talk about that more. And then um, the, the town of Tacopa shows up on the official route of the old Spanish Trail. If you go to the National Park Service and look for the trail route, you'll see the town of Tacopa there. And that's, of course, where we have our operations out of Symbians. So, um, one of the things to point out is, you see that we sh I showed you how the, the route went from here all the way up near Tacopa, down the Amargosa Canyon there. Well, the Amargosa Canyon is where the Amargosa River flows, and during the winter, there are storms and floods, not every year, but many, many years, so those tended to wash out the remains of the trail. And then in the earliest 20th century, a railroad was built, the Tonopah Tidewater Railroad, and it went down the canyon. And then at the, at the beginning of World War II, they came in and tore it all up to use the rail, the steel rail for the World War II effort to build tanks. So. There isn't really any remnant of the trace in the Amargosa Canyon, but it's well documented historically. And so we've just borrowed the maps that Harold Steiner did. And so I won't talk anymore about that part. Okay, now this is accomplished. And you see the, the various colored lines. The, uh, orange line at the top. Hmm. The orange line, the, the orange line here, is Harold Steiner's uh, route. His from his 1999 book, and you see it continues down here over the Emigrant Pass. The red line here is in, from the book by Crampton and Madsen, their 2007 book, and it varies from Steiner's, and then. The fuchsia is the official route on the National Park Service map. And you see that they all are right together there, but they vary here and they vary there. And then the blue line, wherever it's solid, and these tiny little gaps here don't count right now, I'll explain them. But wherever it's solid, that is old Spanish mule trace from the 1829 to 1848 period and not the wagon trail. And what has become clear through our research is that Steiner, Crampton and Madison, and the official route all are based on the wagon trail, not this portion of the trace that we have found. What we have found, we, this is solid blue and it goes a couple miles farther. And up here, because of all the disturbance and a few other things that I'll talk about, we weren't able to actually go and walk the trace and do the GPS record because of Charleston and you and the people of it. So this is a dotted line, the blue is us. We, we've got it estimated through there. And then from here on, we have actually recorded it. That is eight miles and it's contiguous. And it goes about two miles farther west. Okay, so finding one, that eight mile stretch of well-preserved mule trace is not unique. I think, Al, you have, you, you have some mule trace patches. Yeah, now, about how many miles could you say? It's about the same Yeah, so in, in certain places there are stretches of the mule trace, but in California they're relatively rare. 
So we know a little bit about how this mule train, uh, the trace got established. The Mexican excuse me, Mexican period mule caravan, we know a lot about them. You've seen this illustration, that's by, um, I forget the guy's name, uh, German illustrator who was in Mexico. And generally, there were 20 to 200 mules that went from Santa Fe to Los Angeles. They varied widely from year to year in their size. And this is a point I want to ask questions about, and see if anybody has answered. I tried to research how many arrieros, how many crew members there were to tend the mules. And I found in uh, Hafen and Hafen, I found that there were four to 20, and I found another Mexican account that they could be as many as um, 100 for 200 mules. So there is no absolute answer on either how many mules went or how many muleteers there were with that. But at least we do have some data, and if anyone can tell me where I can find stuff, I checked with, um, um, what's her name, Boyle, ex of the National Park Service, and she's written a book on arrieros, and she couldn't give me an answer on how many arrieros there were in these campaigns. Okay, and they usually followed Indian trails leading from spring to spring in the desert. That point has come up before. So originally there were the Indian trails, and then the Spanish, I mean the, the Mexican mule caravans, would follow those. Um, and they went generally nose to tail, the mules, in a single line, and that's why the mule trace is a single single line, a very def definitely different from uh, wagon trails. And one other key point, that the caravans left few artifacts, and that's because the Mexicans had very little by way of metal that they carried along with them. Their clothes were made of leather and cloth. The packs that they put on the mules were framed in wood and tied together with leather and not nailed together. So there's very little chance of finding metal artifacts. And the, the California State Historic Preservation Office has said, well, they said back in 2013, well, you, if you don't have datable artifacts, we can't call this a historic trail. But we've, we've got some answers for that. And here's the eight miles that I talked about where the, the trace leaves the Pahrump Valley and goes into the California Valley. You can see it's labeled there, California Valley. And goes down and it makes a little jog here to go around a hill and then straight on to Emigrant Pass. And that's eight miles of contiguous or essentially contiguous mule trace. And it's almost a bee line. And that's one of the things we found is where it's wagon trails will often take a roundabout road to go around a hill or something else that the mules could easily cross. So the trace up close, this is what we see as we walk it on the ground and record it. Um, first of all, there are diverse geological and botanical environments. The Amarosa Canyon, which is at the bottom here, it, it, you know, you can see it's very mountainous. There's actually water, it's a white canyon. And by contrast, in the California Valley, here it is, um, and it just extends for several miles here. And I've written up there, edge of arroyo, and I'll talk more about arroyos. Here, you see a straight line leading right up to the edge of the arroyo. And the Western California Valley, we did a lot of work, and this is where the trace is approaching Emigrant Pass. <clears throat> So it's a very remote area where we were following the mule trace. There's no sign of modern life. There are no cigarette butts, there are no beer cans, no broken glass, not even any off-road vehicle tracks. I mean, you're really out there by yourself. So 
it's been disturbed, not at all really, by modern life. And because of that, the trace is easily visible to follow and record, and it provides features for indirect dating to prove that this is indeed the mule caravan trace from the actual uh, historic trail period. That's an immigrant pass. Here is where the trace we got. We, uh, this is the west end of the California Valley. We arrive and you can see it begins up a slope here. There's Emigrant Pass. So we have that. And up here, where here is Emigrant Pass. Now you can see this is the North, north Nupa Range. This is the South Nupa. And you see the, the pass or the ridge between them. And you can actually see part of the, parts of the Old Spanish Trace, Old Spanish Mule Trace right down there on the west side, but we were unable to actually find from down here how it actually got to the summit. And just a few weeks ago, I was looking at Google Earth and was trying to see if I could find anything I didn't know. And I took this picture and then I saw a little white line where these blue arrows are pointing a little white line that goes right to the summit. So I now know where that gap in our trace is, and we'll go and record that with GPS sometime later. And then here's a picture of a top immigrant pass. Somebody else showed me that. Now one of the, or showed us that. One of the things that uh, Shippo said was, well, you can't. Uh, we have no evidence that rocks were kicked to the side, which is a typical characteristic of horse or mule trails. Well, you can see right here how clear it is of the rocks, and the big rocks kicked to the side. And uh, I'll show you other places. And again, that's a, a key point. Okay, finding two, the California Valley segments provided two means for indirect dating. And again, this is really important because we have skeptics, including for a long while, the BLM office, our local BLM office has said, no, that isn't the old Spanish trail that goes over immigrant pass. You have no proof of that. Um, that's just a modern horse trail. That was one of the things other people said, well, those are, those, what you're following was created by mule pack mules that served the mining industry from the 1870s on. But we have found two indirect means of proving that what we're following really comes from 1829 to 1848. So um, we use creosote bushes, large ones that are found in the middle of the trace. That's one meaning. And a second means is the trace, when it crosses the royals, gives us an indication. I'm going to show you those things next. And again, notice the rocks kick to the side. I mean, how can one doubt that those rocks were pushed to the side? And you see the single trace. The measure here is um, each of these is about four inches. It's 10 centimeters. So that's five centimeters. Um, I mean, 50 centimeters across, and each one of the, the white and black strips is about four inches. So, in most places, the trail is between 12 and 24 inches wide. Oh. Okay, method one for dating. There's a paper by a fellow named Vasic, and I um, he's a, he was an ethnobotanist and at the University of California, Riverside, and he did a study. He actually, for 30 years, planted little tiny creosote uh, uh, plants and then watched their rate of growth, and he published his paper. Now, many of you know that creosote grows in huge rings. The, the roots are in huge rings, but where an individual bush comes up, that's where what he was measuring. And um, he found 
that they grow at a rate of about four inches in, uh, that takes us back to 18, well, four inches is 136 years ago, which takes us back to about 1860. And we have got many examples of these large prehistoric bushes right in the middle of the trace. So that takes care of the answer that these were created by 20th century horse riders. And 136 years takes you back to 1850, which puts you very close to the old Spanish trail period and again rules out the mines. The mines were only started in 1878 in our area. So we think this is very strong proof that indeed we are looking at the mule trace. And as I say, there are many skeptics of that point of view. Here's another one of these. Um, as I say, each one of these stripes, black and white, is four inches. We took it both horizontally and vertically, and this is near the base. And again, this one is about four inches across. So the age of these, well, I just said what they, what they do. Method number two, and this one is really interesting. There's Scott, who I said did the GPS stuff, and a couple times he and I went across the Western California Valley, following the trace, GPS recording as we went, and we discovered this pattern. Here is the trace, and you can see the edge of the arroyo there, right? So there's, he's standing at the edge of the arroyo, the mules came here, they stepped down, the lowest parts of the arroyo, the bottom there, are about 10 to 15 feet below the edge. It doesn't look that way because of the perspective of the camera, but in fact, it's a very deep, large arroyo. So the mules came there, they went down. Now we can't find the trace out here because when the big rainstorms come and they rush off the, now the Anoka range, they washed away all that. But we would just sort of do a straight line for the other side, and sure enough, we would find it coming out. But when it comes out, it is quite different from the, that straight single line leading to the east edge. Here you can see uh, this, that these big rocks have been torn out from the edge, and here, when they get up to here, it begins to to become a single trace again, and then, as you proceed, we're back to the little 12 to 24 inch single trace. What that tells us is that the mules, when they went down, we can't see that side, but the, the little trace leads up to it. But when they came out, they had to claw their way up. They were laden with hundreds of pounds, and in clawing their way out, they left this sign. So again, 20th century horse riders wouldn't have created something like this. So there's my wife, Barbara, here she is. This is the place the purple lines indicate the scree, the area that was pawed out. And Barbara's standing up there. And you can see the single trace right there with the measuring stick across it. And yet here's another one. Now here I'm looking east. And so you can see the single trace leading here, uh, um, and then it comes, excuse me, here's the arroyo, they're coming here, they claw out an area here, and they claw out an area here. This is 10 feet across. And so it's very clear that you have quite different approaches from the east and the west, and we take that as a dating method. Okay, finding three. Now, you remember I said that the official route shows the trace, or the mule trail, going through the town of Tacopa, and then it, joined, it drops into the Amargosa Canyon and proceeds south. Um, I want to, you remember I mentioned Tom Sudaf. Well, he and Leroy Johnson, both members of our chapter, published a 2016 article in the Journal of the uh, Oregon-California Trail Association. How many of you belong to that or are aware of it? Octa. Yeah, well, in the 2016 
uh, issue, I think it's the winter issue, they published a 30-page article, and especially based on Leroy Johnson's research, they said uh, it gives good indication and Fremont was going east on this trip in 1844. He was heading back to Washington, so he had started down here near Santa, uh, San Bernardino, and he was going, he followed the Amargosa Canyon, and when he got to the Amargosa Canyon, uh, the, here's the Amargosa Canyon, here is China Ranch, and China Ranch has a stream that feeds right into it, and Fremont said, we were going up, the Amarosa Canyon, and we came to a stream on our right, which we did not follow. But the key, and this is what they proved, the military geographers in the 19th century were trained, and Leroy has pictures of training manuals and all. When you're going to describe things along a riverbank, you face downstream. So if he was facing downstream, then the Amargosa River was coming in from the right, and he went, instead, he went up this Willow Creek here, and he probably camped right where China Ranch is. And uh, how many of you have been to China Ranch? So yeah, lots of you, it's a wonderful place. It's a, a date farm now, and it has a large spring, Willow Spring, and there's wonderful water there. And the spot that Fremont described to the camp, he said, we have wonderful water, great place to camp. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> we know, we have um, 1849 accounts from Gordon and Hoover that also describe that they came from Resting Spring following this route down to China Ranch and then into the Amargosa. So we have both uh, Fremont before uh, before the gold rush and before U.S. acquisition, and we have Mormon wagoneers who did it in 1849. So we are arguing, and I'm basing this on Johnson and Sutek, that the the mule trace, as as they were coming this way heading to L.A., they stopped at Resting Spring. Everyone agrees on that, and then. Their trace went straight down to Willow Spring here and didn't go the way it's shown in the National Route. So, now remember, here's Resting Springs to the north, and down at the south is China Ranch. Um, as soon as you leave Resting Springs, there's a big set of mud hills on the other side of the Old Spanish Trail, uh, the Old Spanish Trail Highway. And Leroy and Tom, and that's Leroy's wife, went up on those mud hills. Instead of going the way the official road, they went up on these mud hills, and you can see the trace there, even in the back, right? Clearly, they found the trace. Here's another photographic example. Leroy took this, and you can see it back there continuing, and it's heading right toward China Ranch. China Ranch is right about there, and it's heading directly toward China Ranch, not toward the town of Tacopa. So what Barbara and I and Tom Sutak did was we found a old dirt road that started at China Ranch right at the entrance to China Ranch. And we followed it, and it led right up straight toward Resting Springs. So we followed it and GPS tracked it, and lo and behold, it dead-ended at Mud Hills. And it was very little used. And the reason is, who's going to take a dead-end road? But, you know, obviously some people had done that. Uh, explorers or whatever um, on their motorbike. But we ended up, we parked, and then we said, well, let's see if we can find the trace on the south end of the mud hills. And there's Barbara going up, and lo and behold, there's the trace coming across the mud hills at this side. 
So more evidence that the trade was heading right straight toward China Ranch and not toward the town of Tacoma. And then we got back in the car and we started driving back to China Ranch. And we discovered that alongside the road, and you can see wagon trail marks in some places, uh, we could see oops, we could see portions of the trace following this route. So by the time we got back, oh, and then along the same old dirt road where we found parts of the trace, we also came across artifacts from wagon trails. And these are tin cans, and they have what was called a steam seal there. That's the very earliest technology, and it was used just, be, just be, developed just before the Civil War, and Civil War troops got canned provisions using that technology. So we can date these tin cans to the 1860s or later. So, and, and we know historically that wagon trails followed the so-called Old Spanish Trail to San, to San Bernardino until the 1890s. So this was one of those wagon trains going down to China Ranch. So given all this evidence, the indirect means of dating, finding a good, good evidence to support Johnson and Sutak, our chapter believes, and if there were any MDS people here, I hate to be, we believe it's high time to consider this section of the trace and the wagon trail to become a segment of the official route, because right now it goes from Resting Springs to Tacopa and down, and yet we have good evidence that a lot of it, much traffic went directly to China Ranch. And there's lots more evidence in Johnson and Sutak's article. Finding four. So let's go back to start at Stump Spring now. Let's go to the Nevada end of things. What time is it? How much more time do I have? It's 2.45. It's 2.45. Okay. Um, so let's go back to start at Stump Spring. We can find, we have found Stump Spring. That's no problem in the California line. And we have numerous maps from the 19th century that show what was called the Old Spanish Trail, proceeding from southwest from Stump Spring. There's a dirt road that goes this way toward the Charleston View Street Grid. You can see the street grid there, right? Um, but it's a, a modern road, or it's been heavily used by pickups and vocals and so forth, so you can't see any traces of mule trace or wagon trail. And so, my, the guy who's been helping me with all, all, a lot of mapping and so forth, Tracy DeBault, he said, well look, you guys didn't actually go through on foot and GPS this, so I'm going to put in an estimated route based on the other folks' work, which he did. So the blue line there is an estimate of where the old Spanish trail went through the Charleston Street grid, the Charleston View Street grid. The broken. What's that? The broken blue line? Yeah, the, the dotted blue line here. As I said, solid means We've GPSed it on foot, but this is where we estimated, because of all the disturbance in this area, the, the old Spanish Trail Highway itself, a modern highway, goes right through there. It was bulldozed and leveled, and all of this area is impacted. <clears throat> so it's clear, this is one of the really key points now, it's clear that the trace is, and we were surveying in this area here. The question is, how does the location of these graves relate to the divergence between the mule trace and the known wagon trails? Well, <clears throat> they may represent these graves, and you can see 
two, two examples there. They're largely, they've been disturbed since 2019, but they're about six feet long. Some of them, others are shorter, three feet, four feet. So it could be adults and children, or it could be that the, this one was more disturbed. But we found, documented 11 of these possible graves. And in 1848, Mormon battalion members were returning from San Diego to Salt Lake City. Some of them went by boat up to San Francisco, some went up to California Central Valley, and a group led by a guy named Hay of Boyle, Harold Boyle, no, Henry Boyle, uh, he took a bunch and they decided to go back via the old Spanish Trail. So they came up to San Bernardino from San Diego, picked up the old Spanish Trail, went over Cajon Pass and so forth. And when he delivered his report in 1848 of what they had done, he said, as we were coming back up the old Spanish Trail, we came across a massacre and we buried the bodies. And he said, these people had been killed by a flint knife cut below the throat. So he, he meant by that that it was Native Americans who had performed the massacre. And these graves are very similar to miners' graves and other graves across the desert area where they covered the grave with large stones to prevent coyotes from digging up the bodies. And these graves here are from the mining area, very near the trace, and you can see that they look exactly the same, piles of rocks about six feet long. The difference is, of course, these have wooden crosses, and we can date these to the period of between 18, 79 and 1920, but the graves are just the same as the ones that we found, and our graves are quite a distance away from these, which are considered the official route, diverge somewhere near the bottom of the Charleston Street, uh, the Charleston View Street grid, and you can see um, Tracy made his dotted line go up here, and this is where we have picked it up and gone this way and documented it on foot with GPS. <clears throat> so how does, and let me add one other thing, we have found some graves. In 2010 we found what appeared to be graves, and we documented those we made a report and turned in the information to the National Park Service and the BLM and the BLM said yes this is a site that needs to be protected.